Hello and welcome to Level 7 Access, a Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. I'm Jamie Blumberg. I'm Paige Branson. I'm Michal Schick. And I'm Michelle Huber. And it's just us tonight. We're recording at a different time than we normally do, so things are a little discombobulated. Uh, Devin is still at at work or coming home from work, and JD is not able to be here because of a family medical uh, situation. Devin been later, depending on how long we go. Yeah, Devin may come back, come in at some point. It's true. We may have a sneak appearance from Devin. <laughs> It'll be like uh, like when they do a show and they have the credits, and like, and they'll have and a person at the end. It's be and <laughs> Devin McGovern Johnson. Right, Devin. <laughs> Special appearance by Devin. Yeah. <laughs> Credits roll. Wanda rewinds them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He gets inserted at the end, George Lucas style, <laughs> like a, like a do back, but it's Devin McGovern Johnson. <laughs> Just his face on it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're saying he's Anakin Skywalker? Yeah. No, I'm saying he's a special edition uh, a treat <laughs> for the re release later because we just can't keep tweaking the, the podcast. Yeah, Jen said she thought she was the thing of Pietro showing up in WandaVision, just like uh, Devin showing up at the very end there. We think we recognize him, but we're not sure. All right, but we're not here to talk about WandaVision. That show's over. It's, that's so... March, was it? Yeah, something like that? Yeah, yeah. This, this is June, and it's Loki time. So we're going to here talk about the, thir- the third episode of Loki, titled Lamentus, which is a name that only makes sense if you've seen the episode. Mm-hmm. So before we jump in, was there anything else we want to talk about? I don't think there's any Marvel news or anything like that, was there? Nothing that I can remember off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> I heard that Disney is apparently trying to yell at people for using Loki because it's trademarked. I'm trying to copyright the like the Norse gods. <laughs> Loki for some fucking insane reason. It's like, no, you you don't get to do that. Like that's not not how it works. Guys. Yeah, guys, you're using a basically a public domain character. You can't like yeah. fully copyright it. You could, I mean, there's something, something you said about like copywriting like this sort of portrayal, maybe. But yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. But, like the concept of this Norse god that <laughs> was not made by you. Like you don't get to do that. <laughs> I I would suspect that their their approach is probably go for the big grab and then collect everything that you can pick up. Yeah, and there's also something to be said for companies like it's in their DNA to like try the most audacious bullshit they can get away with, and but they know they're not going to be able to get away with all of it, but they got to try for it anyway, just in case, kind of thing. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's, I'm not surprised they're trying to do something like that. I'm not surprised. Uh, it sets legal precedent to bitch smack them in the future. So I'm like, you know, good luck because you you just you gave future cases some fire against you. Unfortunately, you lose this one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, no other Marvel news that I'm aware of at the very least. So let's go ahead and just jump into uh, what we thought about this episode. And I know, McCall, that you really want to talk about this one. So how do you go first? <laughs> yeah, um, I have so many emotions. <laughs> I, 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 I was like on board for like the beginning. And I was like, okay, cool. This is all right. Chase happening running etc <clears throat> snarking and then at a certain point probably around when they get on the train it just becomes a fan fiction <laughs> like i and i'm literally just like i i can't actually believe that this is real and i mean i i said this for the first episode but it's like a bajillion times more true now that i'm just like you you're just kind of watching this adventure with Loki and he stops and talks about his feelings a lot and gives speeches about how love is a dagger and sings in his guardian. <laughs> and I'm, I, I, I can't believe it exists. And like, I know this, I think a lot of people like this episode. It was also uh, from what I, we, unfortunately we don't have JD, the, the review aggregator here. Um, but I, I think a lot of people had less positive feelings about it. Um, and I could understand that in some ways because goodness knows I've, I've felt that way on other shows at other times. But like, I don't know, like this is feels like I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to turn up my nose when they go hear me. Hal, here's the television show that you want. <laughs> like, I'm mm. not going to do that. 
Yeah, so speaking of JD, he did uh, say that he wanted us to tell people that he liked the episode a lot and to, quote, fuck the hot takes of what a weird misstep, because that's some, some of what we've heard from some some people, is that they thought this was uh, this was not the, what they were hoping for out of this episode. I was going to say, like, let's go through, like, the takes from the interwebs of what people are saying. If you have some of that, that would be great. I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> well, then thanks, Paige. You're so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the idea woman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's my understanding that there were some people who thought the episode ended kind of suddenly and abruptly. And there could be something to say, said for that because this episode does do some weird stuff in terms of like it brings you up to the edge of like all out action and then just like pulls it out from you and stops. Like the beginning of the episode, we start with this chase scene and the, this battle, and then like suddenly they're just in a wasteland, and like the action grinds to a halt, which is I think is fine. I, I think it, it worked because then you get all this introspection, and then, then t- again talking about their feelings and stuff like that, and like the bickering back and forth and that sort of thing. I think that all works, but it definitely is the the episode ducks and weaves away from what you expect is going to happen. I think. And then I think it happens again at the end where they you've got this like action scene of them rushing through the the like spaceport area trying to get to the ark and beating people up and like Loki catches an entire building and magic is back into place, which is something like, oh, you could do that the entire time. Like, why can't you like fly over there or something? Uh, and then it just ends on this like downer and it's just done. And I could see why some people could get off put by that. It's definitely it's audacious, I think, if that makes sense. So I think that w- that might be part of what people are reacting to. I think when when it ended, I was like, oh, that's interesting or something. Like, I, I definitely said something out loud about it um, less than 24 hours ago when I watched the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, and, and to be clear, like, this episode is a flavor. Like, yes. it definitely, it, it it's it's got a taste and it is it is providing that taste and that is, you know, what it's doing. Um, but I also think I, I actually don't like the, it ended really abruptly critique because last week's episode also ended really abrupt. It ends on, on Mobius shouting, damn it. And then just cuts out, mm-hmm. you know? So like, yeah. and it, it didn't, it's not as abrupt, but I think when you look back, it's like, Oh no, these are two very abrupt endings. And like, it's slipping my mind how the first one ends, but like it's a style. And I don't know. I I I I saw you know, and some people who are who I you know consider friends who are like, it's terribly written, and why are these why are the people on this planet acting this way, and blah blah blah, and I'm just like I don't know, I don't care, <laughs> like it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I I I loved how abrupt that ending was, and like I I don't I don't know what to tell you, like <laughs> I I don't know what anyone wants from that, like I basically. Like, when I saw people being angry about how abrupt that ending is and how it, like, just cuts off like that, I just, I, I imagined myself getting up on a mountaintop, both hands around my mouth and screaming, That was the point! <laughs> like, yes! Yes, it was abrupt! Yes, it was, like, a cliffhanger! They did it. It was the point. Like, what do you, I don't, what, what, what's the complaint? <laughs> they did the thing. <laughs> they did it. Uh, so that's, that's where I start to get a little crazy. But like, yeah, that was the point. They did it. They did that with style. That was the point. That was the point. Um, that, that's my problem. <laughs> yeah, I think in our group chat, we said something like, how dare this show have a like artistic voice, basically? Like, you know, how dare they decide that they want to have a style and they want to have a, 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 a feeling for the show and a sort of directorial vision, basically. Because you are you are right, McCall, that both episode two and three do kind of end sort of abruptly when you think about it in, in, uh, in hindsight. I think three is more stark just because of the, uh, just sort of like the juxtaposition between the, the heavy action that was immediately happening beforehand and then the like womp womp as the arc explodes and then they just sort of look so defeated and, and I think it's Sylvie just starts like, she just like fucks off and she like starts walking away. I love it. I love it so much. After all that, she's just like, Oh fuck it. And then just like fucks off out of the scene. And then it ends. Like it's so jarring and it's so good that it's so jarring 
Because again, me on the mountaintop for everyone to hear echoing my voice throughout the ages. That was the point. <laughs> yeah. So, listeners, if you ever have a chance to listen to us live, uh, you should take that opportunity because you did like say things in our Discord, and I get to read them on the episode because I think they're funny. So, uh, Putanesca on our Discord wrote, "I wonder how the show will go next week when it restarts with two new Loki variants. Now that these two are dead." <laughs> <laughs> I I would I, I would make it my life's work to meet the lady in charge of this show. It's uh, Kate Heron, the director. It, I would meet Kate and I would hug her. I would give her a good hug and I would ask her if she wants a croissant or a cookie or some coffee, just something. I would I would need to be like I you have a I, I have a life debt to yeah, you. Yeah, and then you'd ask her if you could, if she could point you towards Michael Waldron, the writer, so you could do the same thing for him. <laughs> Yeah, another another good thing that Jen pointed out is that the episode was only 36 minutes. So this was a shorter episode, actually. But it felt like it packed in a lot. It felt like, it honestly felt like a movie. It felt really long. And that is just because, like, the slower dialogue moments and me being, like, me personally being really into them. Yeah, this, this episode did not feel brief in any way. It felt like a lot happened. Just, just to touch on the conversations, on the on the sitting down and talking scenes... Like, this is clearly something the show is doing. Like, when when we had Mobius and Loki in the first episode, I was like, oh, okay, this is awesome. But, like, it might, it, this might be their, their nod to that, you know? To people kind of wanting to have these, these, these fan fiction-like chats and just indulgent wastes of screen time where you just talk um, and have feelings about things. But, like, no, nope. They've done it in every episode, and... I hope they continue to do it in the last three because it is it is what the show wants to do. And it is it just it, it delights me on so many levels. I can't even speak of it. This doesn't feel like a show that is like winding up towards a big action finish like WandaVision did. Like, I don't feel like that's what's coming necessarily. Like, I'm sure there's going to be action still of some kind. But like, I don't see this show like ending in a big like final fight necessarily it, it might but that doesn't seem like the point for this show if that if you know if you understand what i mean like yeah like a big marvel battle basically yeah like because because our, our protagonist isn't a superhero this is the first marvel mcu thing where the protagonist is not a superhero the protagonist is a villain and not even like the reformed version that we got in thor ragnarok and, and infinity war and that sort of thing this is just this is the evil loki who is trying something different somewhat and being like a weird goofball who gets drunk on trains and i don't see like a heroic battle for the fate of the universe at the end of this necessarily i mean maybe something like that turns out because it turns out the timekeepers are evil and then loki and sylvie team up to take them out or something but i i kind of doubt that i don't know i I just i don't know where the show is going and that's really cool i'm wondering if the the uh, the show is going to make Loki into a hero in that he, you know, because we find out that the TVA people were real people that somehow got drafted or forced to work for the TVA. So I wonder if he's going to be ter- kind of turned into a hero by, you know, giving these people back free will. I mean, that's possible. And wouldn't that just be like the worst thing you could do for Loki to make him like important and heroic and beloved and like just the worst thing you do for his ego basically that would be what would be so good and that would make it season two interesting as well because then he starts the season the season like beloved and then it obviously goes a horribly wrong somehow and then that's that could be the catalyst for the second season maybe but yeah that would just be that would be an interesting twist certainly um speaking of michelle that was a great thing you brought up that the uh, the fact that we we find out that the tba agents at least some of them used to be actual people used to be variants according to sylvie um i saw somebody have a, a theory about mobius and the reason he likes jet skis and 90s soda so much is because he was an actual person living in the 90s before he was drafted by the tva i would give that a 95 percent chance of being true I- Oh, I can't I can't wait like if they show it which like I hope they do just like show his before times just like living his life on a jet ski just like I don't know just being like just be like hey oh William like listen like here here's a jet ski and here's like a six pack of beer 
We're just going to turn on the camera. <laughs> but it has to be some sort of specific beer that only existed during that time period. Because we'll go with his weird retro soda thing. Yeah, because be- before this episode, I was thinking that maybe uh, Bobus is actually an another Loki variant. Just like a really like in deep one. I thought that would have been an interesting master stroke, but now I'm just thinking that now he's probably just some dude who, who lived in the 90s to explain his jet ski fetish. Uh, and now Loki I'm... knows something about him that he doesn't. Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> just... Yeah, that's a very it's good point. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I was just say I I didn't really get to say what I thought of the episode. Yeah, no, I was gonna, I was about to say uh, we we've kind of we've been talking a lot, so why don't you go ahead and chime in with what you thought? Um, I liked it. Uh, I got a lot of District Twelve vibes from it, and that kind of put me off because as soon as I got that thought, I'm like, oh, that's kind of like Hunger Games, and oh, that's kind of like Hunger Games. Like the guards look like peacekeepers, and then you know the rich people on the train have like gold all over their skin and everything. So it's like just extraordinary wealthy and just like being so wasteful. Yeah. While people are starving in masses. And, um, and then also there was a lot of times when I felt like I almost felt like it was like a uh, video game at some points because, you know, towards the end when they're running, it's one long shot. It doesn't break. Yes. The camera just follows them. And that could be like a video game where you're just playing a character trying to get through the crowd. And uh, Nathan Drake, like like those games. Yeah, it's like like an Uncharted sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my since uh, I'm not a big gamer, my my view came from like uh, the Star Wars game. Uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Yes, that one. So, um, I liked it, and, uh, there was one thing that was, like, hanging, like, a shadow over the whole episode, and that they, these are two, basically, two basic Lokis just talking, sitting down and talking. A brother and Thor is never, neither the word brother nor Thor is ever mentioned. Yeah, that's a very good point. They talk about their mother, but they don't talk about the rest of their family. Yeah, and I think even odin gets a shout out or maybe i'm confusing that with the last episode but i'm like you're seriously gonna sit down and do all these deep feelings and you're not gonna mention a sibling like maybe uh sylvie didn't have a brother maybe thor is also a girl in that and from her timeline but like it's just so I was like, are you seriously not going to mention, like, the whole point of Thor, of Loki is that he's Thor's brother. This, this Loki probably doesn't like Thor as much as, like, the previous Loki that we've, we've had time with because this Loki just got his shit wrecked uh, by Thor, like, a couple hours ago, basically, <laughs> in the Avengers. So he's probably like, yeah, yeah fuck him. <laughs> yeah, but it's, still, it's a very good point, though. They still don't, they, they go into their family a little bit, but not, like... It would have been nice if they had like let's uh, let's go down a checklist of like well, how is it for me and how is it for you to like compare our existences, but they don't quite go there. And he could have even made made like one single mention of like and just mentioned it. So, but to me, the fact that he didn't uh, mention Thor at all that that uh, it didn't bother me, but it like it stood out to you. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it stood out. Anyway, besides that, I I liked the episode. Um, I had to watch it the second time before i really liked it because the first time i kind of got bored i don't want to say i got bored but like there was other things that distracted me like i wanted to keep my eye on it like watch it but then sometimes it'd be like well i don't want to watch it as much as i want to (laughs) it's definitely not an action-packed episode it's got the brief moments of action but it's otherwise there's a lot of character stuff and a lot of like a lot of deep feelings quite frankly yeah oh I also like the fact that we know that Ravana is a fighter. Yeah, that's true. She doesn't say in the, in the, on the back, uh, on the sidelines at all. That's very true. Yep. That's all my feelings for now. So the Thor thing is interesting. I, it didn't even occur to me, which is really shows you where my Marvel priorities are at. Um, but like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think Loki would have wanted to bring him up at that point. You know, like, the, first of all, I mean, they're both still very guarded in that conversation. Um, like, the, the the conversation about their mothers is is kind of the only crack that they really 
give away. And yeah, I just don't know. I just don't think Loki would like, you know, last time he saw Thor, he was like slapping the mask and handcuffs on him. And, you know, like he's, he's just, he's, he's not in that place. And I, you know, it's interesting the way time is working because I, I do think a fair, I don't know about criticism, but like observation of the show is that this does like, as much as we know that this is 2012 Loki, like there's sort of a, gravitational pull toward Loki in, you know, the end of, of Ragnarok and um, the Loki who tried to kill Thanos. But, like, to me, it's also just, like, well, time time passes differently in the TVA, you know? Like Mobius said, it's, it's like, he, he is having time to process some of these things, but that doesn't mean that, like, he's able to, I don't know, have peace with you know, the the central and enduring rival of his entire life and, and being. Yeah, I, th- I think bringing up Thor at this point probably would be too raw for him, really, I think, is the issue. So I wouldn't be surprised if he comes up at some point later in the show, but I don't think, uh, I, I think especially considering that Loki watched, you know, This Is Your Life in episode one and saw and saw Frigga's death and that kind of th- stuff. I think that probably sticks out to him more right now than, and then his broken relationship with his brother is what makes sense to me. Yeah. And he hates Odin. He just straight up hates Odin. So he's yeah. probably not going to talk about him. As unless, much he, as unless he has to basically. Yeah. It will actually be interesting though, because they sort of made him confront the Frigga part of his life. If yes. they do make him talk about Thor and, and now I'm like, very possible that they do have some experience where they make him talk about Thor. Yeah, it's definitely quite possible. But I think uh, I think it was also maybe like the unwritten or the the unspoken thing is they also don't want to have to like explain why there's no cameo from Chris Hemsworth in the show because they didn't want to shell out for it. I think is probably what the real answer is. Well, yeah, well, but if, I don't want one. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like this is how uh-huh. Loki has always been in Thor's shadow, and like I think it's fair to be like. We can just focus on Loki at this point. You know, Loki's yeah. not in uh, Love and Thunder as far as we know, so. What if he was? Man, that'd be crazy. To have this Loki variant show up. If Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has taught us anything, it's that all the Avengers can be present without being present. <laughs> yeah, you can have their, their uh, at the very least, their uh, impact can be felt, even if they're not there. So one thing that actually, uh, uh, what was uh, that, uh, Putinesca on Discord pointed out is that Sylvie doesn't, doesn't reveal much about herself. Is that because maybe she doesn't remember her life before she was made into a TVA agent? Maybe that's part of what the her motivation is that she was brainwashed by the TVA but broke free of it somehow, potentially. I think it's an interesting idea. You know, how do we think? Do we have any theories right now about why Sylvie's doing what she's doing, or do we think that's too premature to really go into? I think it's too premature, or I'm I'm willing to to not give too much of a shit about that yet. Like. I'm willingly really just being like, no, nah, I'm not going to come up with any theories. I want them to tell me. I- I'm fine. Like, at a certain point, if like a if if a story is told well enough, and if I'm engaged well enough, then I'm kind of like, yeah, you, you, you just rock, rock me. Do it. Do it. Do what you got to do. <laughs> like, I don't know yet. I have nothing. But go ahead and try and theorize stuff, and then Devin will come in, and then he'll say what is actually happening. And then we'll be like, yeah, you're so smart. Or or he'll say something just so completely bonkers. It doesn't make any sense. (laughs) We're like, yeah, you're fucking crazy. And then it happens. And you're like, oh, all right. (laughs) God damn it, Devin. (laughs) But no, I think it is an interesting idea, like, to to think of, like, how Sylvie knows that the the TV agents are are all variants and, like, how she came across the information. Like, I think we'll find that out. And I think it will be interesting to find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would rather... I find out the answer within the show than on the internet. Like I want yeah. them because I want to see how they're going to tell me. It was cool to learn anything about Sylvie in this episode, quite frankly, because she was such a mystery last episode. Like she's a Loki, but she doesn't look like Loki and her, she's in the credits as Sylvie. And what does that mean? And all that kind of stuff. And I don't know. If they got any information at all, it was good. I'm glad they gave her a name. So I don't have to go back and forth of, describing the various Lokis. Yeah, that's very true. Giving her her identity just makes her easier to differentiate for the viewer as well, I think. Yes, because last week was a chore. 
<laughs> I wouldn't necessarily count on that continuing uh, with possible other appearances, but oh, okay, you think there, there might be some other Loki variants coming in at some oh, point? Yeah. yeah, I think there's, there's a good possibility of that. I want like fifteen, you know, on the screen at once. I'll be pretty happy about that. <laughs> Just different variations. Just... Then you can read page. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I really want a hulky. <laughs> I, re- I really want that athletic Loki, the one who's just like wearing a tracksuit or like a, oh no, it was like a marathon outfit. He just looks so happy. He definitely went to the Olympics. Yeah, exactly. He's, he, he was in the actual time where there was no pandemic. He got to go to Tokyo 2020. Well, do we want to go ahead and start getting into the rundown? I feel like uh, we've done a pretty good job of covering our general feelings about the episode. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and start off. So as we said before, this is Loki episode three, Lamentus. It's written by B- Bisha K. Ali, directed by Kate Heron. So we start with an upbeat song playing over the Marvel logo as it lingers for an extended amount of time. We first see a waitress and then Sylvie at a table with C20. They seem like good friends. C20 gets brain freeze and Sylvie tells her that freezing the roof of your mouth causes synapses to freeze, literally causing memories to be frozen in place. C20 doesn't believe this but gives herself brain freeze again so that Sylvie can ask her a question. Sylvie asks... How many people are guarding the timekeepers? And C20 replies, sorry, what? The scene is kind of reset, basically. And C20 looks around, clearly confused. Sylvie grabs her hand and asks how long they've been friends. C20 can tell Sylvie anything. So why doesn't she tell Sylvie how many people are guarding the timekeepers? Real quick, has anyone ever been able to voluntarily give themselves brain freeze? Not Early, no. I mean, you can. I mean, sure, it's possible if you really drink a cold stuff, you know, quickly enough and that kind of thing. I feel like my brother and I have tried, and we weren't able to do it. Maybe you just weren't trying hard enough. Did you think about that? <laughs> I feel like I have brain freeze just thinking about brain freeze. So. <laughs> Sympathetic brain freeze. Exactly. Yeah. So C twenty starts to answer, but stops mid sentence. She remembers this place. She knows it, but she doesn't know Sylvie. It's a magical place. Yes. Sylvie tells C20 that she's just tired. Sinister music starts, and then we cut to Sylvie touching C20's temple and using magic at the rocks cart. C20 replies, yeah, I'm just tired, in a daze. Sylvie asks how she finds the elevators, and C20 replies that they're gold. Sylvie looks into a security monitor and sees that Loki and the TVA have shown up. Title card. Okay, replying that they're gold doesn't feel like an answer to a question of where something is. Yeah, you're not wrong. Like I was, a, I mean, I guess I figured that it's all she'd get out of her in time because she was, because she still was basically running out of time there. And I also had to wonder where she, how she knew to look for elevators. She could have learned earlier, I guess. There are definitely questions about like how much Sylvie knows about the TVA because when she gets there, she tries to imagine it doesn't work and she's obviously surprised at that. So in my mind, that's like, oh, she's never been here before. But she knows the TV agents are variants. So maybe it's like she has been, but she f- doesn't remember it. Or she only remembers parts of it, maybe, or something. Or maybe she's pulled this trick off multiple times and gathered a little bit of information at a time. Possible, yeah. She's, because we know that she's been a pain in the ass to, for the TVA for an extended period of time, which is why they wanted to catch her so bad. Yeah. So maybe she's gotten some information from some other agents and she's just sort of like piecing it all together now. Yeah, that's what I mean. Definitely possible. Yeah, and if she fizzed them out of existence, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't know. Yeah, I saw somebody theorizing that maybe that doesn't actually fizz people out of existence. It just reset. It just brings them to like into the TVA to be reset and reprogrammed into agents, basically. Hmm. It's an interesting possibility. It'll be interesting if we see that son of the investor from yeah. episode one. This was really sad, though. I thought this was like the C twenty story is now is now really quite moving to me and upsetting mm. c20 is the breakout character for you yeah <laughs> a little bit it also gave me framework vibes yeah of like being in this alternate universe where you're trying to like uh you're pulling things from people's memories and that kind of stuff yes but that's me my brain always going to agents of shield it always will i live with it but i mean it makes it it makes it like i don't know i found that that moment where like it clarifies to you what c20 is means when she says it's real like the place she had been there, mm. and she had actually experienced that, and it was a real memory. That makes sense, yeah. That's a very good point. I didn't think of that. So jumping to where we left off in the previous episode, Sylvie exits a time door in a corridor at the TVA. Without magic, Sylvie resorts to hand-to-hand combat. 
Loki exits the same door a few seconds later and immediately arms himself with daggers and walks through the destruction. Did you guys notice the freaking busy tone on the... Well, it was like, like, like a phone, like like dial tone kind of thing or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, why does the TVA need that? Why do they need anything that they've got? They've got all this weird retro tech. It's, it's such a like weird uh, you know, front they're putting on. It's, it's very strange. It's certainly a choice of an aesthetic. Yes. So Sylvie and Loki meet up. Loki points his daggers and says, A few questions. Sylvie, have you really not got anything better to do? Loki, rude. Are you sure you're a Loki? Sylvie, you're in my way. Loki says, you are my way. They fight. Loki thought perhaps they would work together. Sylvie's not interested. Loki sees that Sylvie lacks vision. They fight some more. Loki says she either comes willingly or she doesn't. Either way, that's how he he meets the timekeepers. So it's interesting here because Sylvie definitely left that door open long enough for Loki to come through. But yet she acts like he's not doesn't belong there and she, he's in imposition. It's very... She's playing a game, it seems like, maybe, of some kind. It's not very clear. Either that or she's incompetent and doesn't know how to close the door after herself <laughs> properly, which seems weird. Yeah, I had questions about that, too. Uh, she could have been distracted by him and forgot. Oh, yeah. It's, it's possible. When she came through the time portal, she comes across a guard. So maybe the guard made her forget to close the door. Maybe. It's definitely possible. I, I got the feeling that she left it open on purpose or like seemingly left it open on purpose. But yeah, I don't know. That, that might be my one quibble with the episode potentially is that it, she seems to like, it seems like at the end of episode two, she was like kind of beckoning him through in some ways, but then she acts like he's such an imposition to be there the entire time. So I don't know what her plan is or if she, maybe she has master strokes or master levels of this that we don't quite get yet potentially. Yeah. Jen says that maybe she wanted him to follow to show him who the timekeepers were, not expecting him to ruin things. Definitely possible. That they talked before that. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I, there's something missing, I think, that needs to be explained, which hopefully gets explained. I, I The one thing that kind of stops me from judging it immediately is that I, I don't necessarily think that either she or Loki are telling each other their full plan. Yeah. <laughs> so... There could definitely be things going on. Like, even when they're, like, bonding at the end of the episode, I'm like, oh, there's still a whole bunch of crap that you guys aren't. I'm not even sure how much of this is true. Yeah. That's a very good point. We, we Just because they're talking doesn't mean that they're telling the truth at all, any of it. So. And there's also possibilities, like, so, I saw somebody also theorizing that, like, when, when Sylvie tries to enchant Loki, maybe she actually was successful and everything we see after that is in the enchanted brain of his, potentially. Uh, when 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 it didn't go off supposedly, and then like, and then later she was talking about like how she does it, and I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, there could be something like that going on as well. It's possible that the other things we think we saw weren't real. How deep is the rabbit hole? <laughs> yeah, it, probably not nearly as deep as we think it is. If if WandaVision taught us anything, my yeah, my my instinct is always just to go like she didn't she didn't enchant him and. While they are definitely still keeping secrets from each other, they are actually on lament, 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 lamentous, lamentous. Um, how yeah. uh, at the moment? How else do they get off of the planet if not for her just being like, eh? Mo- Mobius shows up, finds them, which the apocalypse they're in, basically something like that. I yeah, that's what I thought. I thought I was pretty sure that the TV was just gonna show up at the last second. And I thought Loki was going to be like, oh, actually, it's not even broken. I'm just trying to find stuff out about you. I was illusioning the broken door maker thing. Quite possible, yeah. It seem, it seems like a long way to play that game, <laughs> really close to the end. But um, he, might, that, he could be doing that. Well, I figured if, he, if it was working, he would have just said, fuck you, and left. Well, I think he's probably dead. But the question of whether he actually... Uh broke it or not potentially or uh, yeah i don't know there's there's something else going on i think we just don't know what it is yet i want to see the next episode to find out god damn it yep <laughs> so their fight is interrupted by the appearance of ravana Lorenzlayer. sylvie threatens loki's head and ravana is just like fuck it yeah kill him i don't care but we're rushing the two with a pruning stick loki saves them by using a temp pad and sending them falling through a portal into an air mat into some sort of mattress sort of thing they fight for the temp pad, only for Miss Minutes to announce to Sylvie, you're out of juice. They fight some more, and Sylvie tells him to just give it to her. Loki doesn't even know how to cha- charge it. 
Well, he says he does. Sylvia isn't the only one tech savvy Loki. Sylvia doesn't want to be called a Loki. She goes to take the temp pad, but he magics it out of his hand, leading to her realizing he is just a flaw on magician. He replies that for his next trick, he makes Sylvia disappear. The fight is interrupted by a fireball flying through the roof and almost hitting them. Sylvia asks where Loki sent them, and we see the planet's surface and then the lamentous one and 2077. Uh, we, we do have a Devon now. Oh, we have a Devon, do we? A wild Devon has appeared. <laughs> Hi, Devon. Guest starring Devin McGovern Johnson as Devin <laughs> McGovern Johnson. Special appearance from Devin McGovern Johnson. Devin, what did you think of the episode? Hi, Devin. <laughs> uh, I liked it a lot. Yeah. All right, cool. We're done with that part then. Yep. Goodbye. Bye, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> so the two run, and Sylvie calls Loki an idiot because of the all apocalypses are saved in that temp pad. This is the worst. No one makes it off. They run and dodge and exchange dialogue. Loki thought Sylvie wanted Loki dead, but Sylvie explains that if Loki blows up, the temp pad gets blown up, and then Sylvie gets blown up. They run to a mining shack. Inside it, Loki takes a minute to catch his breath, and Sylvie goes to him, holding her hand to his head. There's a sound and and seemingly doesn't work. Sylvie's trying to enchant Loki, but it won't work. Loki's mind is too strong. At least that's what we're led to believe. (laughs) Now, do you think that part is bullshit, Devin? You usually call it weird little twisties like that um i think probably uh i i don't know if that's the reason but i don't think that the the enchantment worked on loki i think he saw it enough to be able to do whatever to safeguard from it he's just too tricky i I kind of imagine it like trying to like magnetize a magnet or something like (laughs) it's already there man you know Mm -hmm. um i just want to say about um lamentus Mm-hmm. I was. It was something that was actually kind of annoying me about the show, was that it was a very Earth centric. Mm. The, the scope was extremely Earth centric. Yes, and like, especially with the MCU being so you know crazy and and so you know having so many different places and beings and whatever, I really wanted the the scale to to level up a bit, and I was really happy that we. Went to a different planet. It's not a hugely different planet. Everybody still seems to be human, but it's still at least not in the solar system. That so. costs money. Right. It costs money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got Disney money, Paige. Yeah. They, they, can get, they can get some skin paint and some prosthetics. And some filters. Some purple filters. Mm-hmm. Purple filters come free, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So Sylvie prepares to fight again, but Loki is over it and proposes a truce because neither of them can get off this rock until the temp pad is charged. Sylvie inquires where he has hidden that, and he answers his heart. She threatens to cut out his heart then. They argue some more, and Sylvie tells him he only saved her because he needs her to charge it. Loki says, yeah, maybe, that too, sure. Or we could slaughter each other here in this abandoned mining shack. That sounds good to Sylvie, who then tells, uh, says that the plan... Loki interrupted was years in the making. As soon as he gets that temp pad back on, she's going to straight back to the TVA and, and finishing what she started, which we don't know what that is still. It's so weird to have Loki be the reasonable one. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty obstinate here, quite frankly. Yeah. Or a reasonable one, at least. Less unreasonable, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> she starts to leave, and Loki asks where she is going. She explains there is power on this moon. She just needs enough of it to travel through time and space. They start walking. Sylvie's plan is to walk to town. She wants Loki to be quiet, and Loki wants to know what to call her because he is not calling some faded copy of himself Loki. She tells him her name. He says that is not very Loki-like. She asks what makes a Loki a Loki, and he answers independence, authority, style. (laughs) Sylvie replies, naturally, you went to work with the boring, oppressive time police. He's a fragrance ad. (laughs) (laughs) He's also James Bond. Where is he getting the authority from? Where? <laughs> yeah. He likes to think that he projects it, I think. Mm-hmm. Loki replies that he doesn't work with them. He's a, quote, consultant. Sylvie mm-hmm. says, you don't know what you want. Loki, oh yeah? What about you? Your years in the making plan was to tear the place down, create the ultimate power vacuum, and then just walk away. I never have done that. You don't know that, Loki. You don't know what her plan was. Right. And Sylvie says, yeah, well, I'm not you. Can we get on with this now? They make their way to an abandoned town. Sylvie explains that they have 12 hours or so before annihilation and things will only get worse with the gravity quakes, meteors, and the collapse of society. They see a building with a neon sign. Sylvie goes up to the window and checks the coupling. 
So he says, okay, hand it over. Loki says, pitiful. I'm not giving it to you. You're going to have to try harder than that. So he says, then don't give me your tech-savvy ideas either. The temp pad requires a massive power source, not a nightlight. <laughs> well, she was the one that wanted to use it. She was playing, like, she's playing a game with him, like, trying to, like, like trick him into giving it to her, basically. And then she'll, like, run away, I guess, or something. Originally pointed at the light and said, hey, is that a power source? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if that was jokingly or if that was serious and he just didn't understand the scale of what was necessary. I think it was just a weak play. It's just like last episode with the, like, when Loki tried to pull it over in the TVA and, like, said, oh, you're all in danger here. And wolf's teeth, faces, <laughs> wolf butts, whatever. It, it seems like to Loki, the, the ploy doesn't have to be any good or reasonable. It just, it's fun. Yeah. So do it. Ploys are their own reward. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that Loki has no idea how, like, what it takes to charge the temp pad. No, of course not. He calls himself tech savvy, and he he has no idea. <laughs> there are levels of tech savviness. He might have he might have watched a video. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He may he may have watched an, a VHS or no, probably video Betamax actually. Mm. That was w- one of the five that he watch that Miss Minich made him watch. Yeah. So they find a homestead. Loki tells Sylvie that brute force is no substitute for, for uh, like... Something in guile. Sorry, I forgot that word. Yeah. <laughs> for something in guile. Or panache. Something like that. It was something along those lines. Sylvie goes to open the house door and is immediately launched clear off the porch. Loki tells her it is remarkable that she has made it as far as she did. Which, he's not wrong. I think she kicks the door in, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she does. Yeah. Then, as he is out of the uh, the uh, lady homesteader's sight, he apologizes to her. The homesteader tells him not to be sorry because she enjoyed it. Loki enjoyed it, too. He then calls Sylvie's behavior as being like an animal and tells her that they mean her no harm. They are simply weary travelers. The homesteader says, sure you are. Then Loki leaves a picture of the woman's husband to turn into a familiar face. After a few seconds, the homesteader launches Patrice is a person Loki's pretending to be, off the porch as well. Sylvie finds this hilarious. The homesteader explains that Patrice never said a thing that nice in 30 years. They're no travelers, they're devils. Sylvie asks what tactic that that was, diplomacy? Or Loki cuts her off mid-sentence. The homesteader asks what they want with her, and Sylvie asks where everyone is. Lady answers the Ark, and then clarifies the evacuation vessel. This information sends them walking to the end of town to the train station, where they'll never get a ticket. I love watching stuff that takes place in the future, yet sounds like it takes place in 1860. Yeah, it's interesting that, like, uh, it, it's very Star Wars when you have this sort of, like, it's the future, but it's also broke down as, as all hell and that kind of thing. <laughs> and seems, like, kind of weirdly, like, antiquated. And it's, it's, it is very interesting. And, and this is in a galaxy far, far away. Yep. <laughs> At that train station, the mischief gods find a long line of weathered peasants begging for a place on the train. Loki, we can't fi- fight our way onto the train. Sylvie, who said anything about fighting? Loki, all your plans involve fighting. Sylvie, not this one. I'm going to enchant a guard, have him lead us through the crowd, and if anyone gives us any trouble, Loki, make him start shooting. And then what, kill every guard and hijack the train? Sylvie, whether or not there's a fight is entirely up to them. Loki, we're doing this one my way. Loki changes into a guard's uniform. How do I look? Sylvie, like someone with a shit plan. And was that the first time we heard cussing? I I think so. For some reason, that's. I feel like I would have remembered if there had been cussing before. No, Sylvie says, or Sylvie in the body of one of the people from last week says, I got shit to do, man. Oh, right. Oh, that is true. You're right. Okay, but have we heard it before, Loki? I don't think we've heard any of them. Are, well, no, wait, there was, I think it was one time in Falcon and Winter Soldier. You get one. Or at least that's how it works in the movies. You get yeah, one. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Loki's pushing the boundaries with the two now. Yeah. One you get one F word. Uh, that's right. Yeah. I don't know. But I, this, this show is is playing a little more adult, I guess. We got, we got two shits so far, so see how many we get before the end. <laughs> We're in the big times now. <laughs> Disney needs to start planting a PG-14 on these. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have the vague suggestion of non-straightness, so... You know. Ooh, yeah, that's very true. We haven't even gotten to that yet. Hey, it is Pride Month. Loki, it's a great plan. The plan works, but nearly fails when Sylvie must enchant a guard to allow them to pass him. And that guard comes back later. Inside, they go to a dining car, and Loki escorts Lo- Sylvie to a table. She sits down, and Loki wants her to spot because he can't go backwards on a train. I found that hilarious. Yeah, he's got that weird little hang up about being backwards on a train. What the hell, Loki? I, get, I think that means I think that means he gets car sick. I I I I, I it's probably yes. more mind gobliny <laughs> than that. I get car sick and I don't like sitting backwards in a train. <laughs> Paige feels uh kinship with Loki now all of a sudden. Yeah, this is the one thing nope. we can agree on. <laughs> And what was Sylvie's thing that that she can't put her back to a door? But there's doors on both sides. Yeah, right. That actually stood out because a lot of um, veterans who return have to be facing the door. That makes part sense of if she's been PTSD. through fighting for a long time. Right. Like they get um, overwhelmed. I just that stuck out for me because just because I know that covering all your angles. She points out that she can't sit with her back to an exit because there are mo- even though there are multiple. He sits down. Because she tells him to. She then tells him that wasn't a plan. Plans have multiple steps and he just did a thing. She yawns and he tells her to feel free to get some sleep. But she can't sleep around untrustworthy people. And then she tells him, feel free to take a nap. There's just something so interestingly, like, immature about what she says about plans. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like a kid being like, that's not a dessert. It has fruit in it. You know? Or something like that. You You know? know what? That the, their interactions remind me of siblings. Yeah. Mm. Young siblings, too. Yeah. Mm. Petulant children siblings. The way that they fight and bicker and that kind of thing. Yeah. They have great chemistry. I mean, it's... <laughs> Try on talking about uh, her telling him to go take a nap. He says, nice try. Sylvie, I'm not going to waste my time rooting around for the sim pad when someone taught you fairly decent magic. Loki, my mother... Sylvie, what was she like? She was, um, a queen of Asgard. She was good, fairly decent. Sylvie, are you sure she was your mother? Loki, oh no, she's not actually. I was adopted. Is that a bit of a spoiler for you? Sorry about that. Sylvie, no, I knew I was adopted. Loki, what, they told you? Sylvie, yeah, did they not tell you? Loki, no, I mean, they did eventually. He asks if she remembers her mother, and she replies, just... Lips of a dream at this point. That reminds me of when uh, Leia talks about um, Padme. Yeah. yeah. That gave me strong Padme vibes. They smile at each other and Loki turns to the subject back to Frigga. Loki, you know, when I was young, she drew these little bits of magic for me, like turn a flower into a frog or cast fireworks over the water. It all seemed impossible. She told me that I would be able to do it too because because I could do anything. Loki then demonstrates with a fireworks show in the palm of his hands. Speaking of fireworks, you might hear them because my neighborhood has no fireworks restrictions and people <laughs> love our pyromaniacs around here. Same here, actually. Yeah. Well, people send them off down here all the time as well, just like random weekends and stuff like that. It's very strange. Well, I live in a neighborhood with clo- houses very close together, so sometimes they shake the house. Wow. He asks about her magic and she says she taught herself. Loki, you taught yourself that magic? Sylvie, yeah, I did. Loki, what, do you just go into their minds and project project some sort of illusion? Sylvie, really? It'd be easier if I just... Loki, enchant me and make me give you the... You could leap out of a moving train? No, thank you. Sylvie, well then, don't ask. (laughs) A waitress comes and brings them champagne. Sylvie declines, so Loki takes hers as well and clings the glass together, toasting to the end of the world. His first mistake. (laughs) <laughs> Double drinks. Loki, a pity the old man chose to die, don't you think? Sylvie, she was in love. Loki, she hated him. Sylvie, maybe love is hate. Okay, Dr. House. <laughs> Loki says he should probably remember that, and magic's a feathered quill to write it down, which he, to which she replies, oh, piss off. And he disappears the quill and paper. On the subject of love, he asks... If she has a bow waiting for her. To a surprise, Sylvie has managed a long-distance relationship with the postman as she runs from one populace to another. People are quite willing in the face of doom. It was only, it was the only thing keeping Sylvie going. How about Loki? Loki is a prince. Must have been would-be princesses or perhaps another prince. 
Loki, a bit of both. I suspect the same as you, but nothing ever. Sylvie, real? Love is mischief. Mischief, then. Okay. Loki, n- so, so, so let's 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 talk for a second and let's talk about the fact that like oh, we so we actually kind of confirmed it. Is this is this good? Bad? What is this? Like what are we what are we doing here? <laughs> Casual bisexuality is good because it normalizes it, and the fact they don't make a big deal of it is fine. I think. Yep. Well, he also suspects that she's the same way. So does that mean they're both? Yeah. I think that's what they implied. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think when when you are a gender fluid character who can be any gender and that kind of thing, like I think it just makes sense. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. I, I think like bisexuality, like it's not not that it's a uh, obligatory or that it's implied, but it, I think it, it just naturally follows. So I think that's cool that they they did that. I can also Actually turn into a it. snake. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite what I was getting at, Paige, but good for you. <laughs> Just confirmations all over the place here. <laughs> I, I, I guess I appreciate it because it is kind of, I don't know, you know, like every time you want to say something good about it, there's like so many caveats but yeah hey. <laughs> but I, I at least it's it's better than than marvel being like look at the gay representation in avengers endgame with an unnamed man in the, <laughs> in uh, the, it, sport it's group. the main character it's fairly explicitly stated uh even though it's uh, like couched in terms where you could miss it if you weren't mm-hmm. paying attention i think that's the point it's like it's like a smoke signal you don't see it unless you look up. I mean, I think it's a little a little harder than that. But, yeah, I think it's clear. Yeah, no, they 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 never say the words, but they definitely the meaning is there. Mm-hmm. And I guess I guess what I will say for it is that you know the the not even gender, just the fluidity of Loki as mm-hmm. a as a Norse character <laughs> has been kind of so ignored for the most part that like they didn't have to engage with it at all in the series. So I'm glad that they did at yeah. all. Mm-hmm. It, every time that uh, he just breaks out into a song, I'm reminded of that. It's like, oh, they're actually like dealing with his roots as a Norse god. And it was kind of like the, the, the show, like, like Katie's like, like, thing to do this because she's bi as well too and like this is like important to her and I'm very happy about that that pleases me hmm. so like I want to give credit to that I'm not giving anything to Disney ah. yeah <laughs> yes exactly Jesus Christ no. <laughs> <laughs> applaud the artists for doing what they yeah yeah, yeah. It's just representation behind the camera is just as important as it is in front of the camera yeah mm-hmm. about uh, Sylvie's line love is mischief then Loki replies no love is something I'd have to have another drink to think about Loki finishes a glass Sylvie you do realize we're about to hijack try and hijack the power source to a civilization's only hope Loki I do Sylvie it's not going to be easy we should rest Loki all right you lo- you relax your way and I'll relax mine then Sylvie has fallen asleep actually and I do Part of me is like, ah, did he put her to sleep? Did I don't know. <laughs> um, but she wakes up to cheerful music um, as Loki sings uh, a a sort of bar song in both English and Asgardian. Um, and then he sings what you might call a lamentation that is also in Asgardian. And I actually had to pause the episode because I was just overwhelmed. But like I'd heard that they were singing in the episode, but like because you can't, nothing stays totally hidden uh, for these things. But like I, I, I don't, I don't have words. It was just like again that feeling of like, how is this real? How is this happening? <laughs> <sighs> uh, so oh, I also um, wanted to say I appreciate uh, the linguists because I don't know who did the uh, Asgardian, but it really did sound like. Um, like Norwegian, the language sounded a lot like the roots of the original language of North Myth- Norse mythology. Yeah, it's funny. I I also feel like every time I hear a song in a foreign language, like to me, it sounds a little bit like Hebrew. 
because that's like the language I know best outside of English. And like, it's yeah, it, it doesn't really, but it's just like one of those weird, like psychological things. Because your mind is trying to grasp something that you sort of understand. And that's, yeah. that's what it comes up with basically. Yeah, I think so. Um, there were a lot of times in Spanish class where girls would just like start talking in Hebrew because they were reaching for something that they didn't know. And it was like Hebrew was closer than Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so Sylvie spies uh, someone looking at Loki and then leaving. Um, Loki toasts to Sylvie and does the throws the glass down on the ground and orders and says, another. And I was like, oh, <laughs> there's your Thor reference. Yeah, if you need exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so Sylvie uh, goes to him and starts kind of reaming him out for being drunk, but he says he is just full, but bear in mind, very full. Um, Loki wants her to try a plate of something, and of course he has ditched the uniform because nobody here cares, it's the end of the world! Which I'm starting to think are Loki's favorite words, actually. (laughs) Um, Sylvie thinks that someone's coming for them, um... And because people looking at him weirdly, uh, Loki thinks she's being paranoid, but um, she says that, well, yeah, that happened when she was on the run from the omniscient fascist that Loki works for. Um, Loki changes the subject to answer a question, Uh, answer her question. He says, love is a dagger. It's a weapon to be wielded far away or up close. You can see yourself in it. It's beautiful until it makes you bleed. But ultimately, when you reach for it, and Sylvie goes to grab the dagger in his hand, but of course, he disappears it. Sylvie says, it isn't real. Love is an imaginary dagger. And again, like, it's not... It's not good. (laughs) Her delivery of that line just so deflates it. Uh, Both things can be true here, right? Like, it can be both, like, kind of meaningful and like whatever and then also like really lame and like you're drunk Loki go home you know uh, her, her line is the same as him pulling out the quill and pen earlier yeah but I think what's what's interesting about this whole metaphor of his it's like a me- it's it's like a metaphor for him almost like mm-hmm. seems really deep but it's really just kind of shallow and in, very, in ways that are, that are pretty obvious if you think about it too too long does anyone can eat- be like Wait, where'd the dagger go? Daggers don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> see, I've uh, I could easily read this in Jack Sparrow's voice and see him saying it too, <laughs> and uh, just how terrible of a line it is. Yeah, it's very drunk pirate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you also like it's it's <laughs> it's you know you think about it too hard. You can see yourself in it. Well, that kind of depends on the dagger, Loki. You know, like. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it. Though. Like, I I think what I enjoy about it is that they allowed him to say that, you know, to give that kind of speech. This random metaphor thrown in. Like, I came up with this while I was drunk. Here, yep. have it. Exactly. Genius. Uh, Fuck, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> just full, just full. Oh. Uh, Sylvie tells him that's a terrible metaphor, and then, of course, the guards come, and they want to see Loki's ticket, and he attempts to conjure up tickets, which really they should have done in the first place. Um, But uh, he just repeats the fireworks display. So then Loki is grabbed, and a fight breaks out. Loki saves Sylvie uh, with a throw, and it ends up being tossed off of the train. Um, Sylvie and... No ticket. Right. (laughs) Which is a fun reference to earlier when he was... She was like, oh, throw yourself off a moving train, or he said that to her. Um, And, of course, Sylvie throws herself off the train, also after him. Uh, After landing, she holds him at sword point and demands he he turn the temp pad over. Uh, He produces it, but it is smoking. Um, And uh, Which, again, I'm like, "Eh, is it really that broken? I don't know. Um, It's also, uh, like, the layers of it are separated. Like <laughs> Yeah, then it then it kinda of crumbles in his hand, he drops the pieces onto the ground. It is very unusable at that point. If it's real. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Sylvie calls him an asshole and says that he's killed them. Loki, yeah, the, the, the temp pad just falls to the pieces in his hand. Um Sylvie says that he's not a serious man. Loki calls himself a god. 
which he got to get over. Got to I seriously. Um, he says this is actually a great exchange. She says that you're a clown. You got drunk on the train. He says I'm hedonistic. That's what I do. And Sylvie says, I'm hedonistic a lot more than you, I assure you, but never at the expense of the mission, which is just, it makes you think about what kind of person Sylvie is. What a weird <laughs> flex. Yeah, elaborate. Right. elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the drunk, drunk you there ever was, but not while I'm working. <laughs> uh, Loki kind of throws that back in her face and suggests that she too has a glorious purpose. Um, and then he says, you know, you, you can't beat them. Um, Sylvie screams and makes the little magic flashes. And uh, he kind of shows her, her power level and makes Loki pay more attention. Kind of sobers him up a little bit. Yeah. Um, the scream did, in fact, make her feel better. Um, and she suggests he try it sometime. They talk about what to do next, and they kind of hit on the arc uh, that might not, like, get destroyed if, or not take off or whatever, um, if they are on it. Which sort of doesn't, I mean, definitely would attract the TVA, because that would hardcore make... Yeah. Yeah. But I guess they don't really care about that at this point, so... They're just trying to get off alive. That's the most important thing. Right. Right. If they get off alive, yes, it would attract the TVA, but they might be able to then hijack the power source or then they have TVA agents and another temp pad, which I think might be what eventually happens. Mm-hmm. And- um, so then they start walking and I think a lot of people were frustrated that it was like, you're just walking. <laughs> you were on a train and now you're walking. Far. It made me think if Loki had any, I guess he doesn't have any power, like magic powers that could make them like not have to walk. He can't just teleport or anything. Uh, not not that long a distance. I don't think. And like, he probably he has to know exactly where he's going. Yeah, I think we've seen him do little bamfs, but he might have just been making himself invisible and running across the room. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's true. Yeah, his powers are again. I think, and people are having trouble with this, like just very In- vague. Or but vague. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really bother me. I'm I'm kind of okay with that. Um, but as we'll see soon, uh, telepathy is one of his powers. He can definitely yeah. do that. Of course. Um, Loki says that he doesn't think he's ever walked this much in his life. <laughs> um, Sylvie, you know, says that's a good life, and Loki's like, oh, you know, you're glad, you're lucky you missed it. Um, she finally tells him how the enchantment works, uh, with, you know, the, um, grabbing hold of someone physically and then grabbing hold of their mind. And sometimes it's easy. Other times it is uh, a lot less, uh, easy and she is in control, but they are there too. Uh, and she has to create a fantasy from their memories. And Loki says, and you call me a magician. Sylvie actually brings up C20, and says that her mind was uh, very messed up, everything clouded, and Sylvie had to pull a memory from hundreds of years prior before she even fought for them. And Loki's like, uh, blah, 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 what? Uh, and it turns out that, yeah, uh, C20 was a regular person on Earth who loved margaritas. Uh, and <laughs> Loki's like, but they told me that the TVA created everyone, and the timekeepers created everyone who works for the TVA. And Sylvie says, that's ridiculous. They're all variants, just like us. And that is like, I don't know if I'm stupid that it hit me that hard, but like, I just thought that was a really clever twist on everything. Because I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and people thinking about like who Mobius is and whatever. And I feel like nobody really was like, oh, they're all just variants. Yeah. Uh... I don't think we thought that they were like all <laughs> variants, but I think that it did cross our minds that like maybe. We're, we're There's gonna, something else going on. Yeah. I, out that Mobius was just a jet ski salesman. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. There's there's the Devin. There's That's never that's a elevation of what I was thinking earlier is that yeah. he was, he's some guy from the 90s who really like jet skis, but that's even more jet ski salesman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what can I do to get you into this bad boy and he slaps the jet ski? Yeah. <laughs> Right. And yeah, that's mm-hmm. yeah. Or he yeah. rented them on a boardwalk or something, you know. He's really into uh, obscure sodas from the nineties. That's that's what uh, that's, that's his whole deal. 
Because <laughs> he lived it. Mm-hmm. And it makes all of this a billion times more sad. And Right. And, like, so awful on the part of the timekeepers that they have just stolen and brainwashed these people to do their bidding. Like, Renslayer is probably in on it, too. So he's going to have that betrayal of, like, Mm -hmm. you fucking didn't tell me. Like, what's up? (laughs) Oh, it sounds like Coulson. It it, it is not unlike Coulson. (laughs) Um, It also, though, does make what Sylvie has been doing a lot nastier, to be honest, because brutally murdering real people is a lot more problematic than brutally murdering imaginary invented timekeepers mm-hmm. you know I mean, well loki hasn't murdered a few people brutally <laughs> <That's true. laughs> speaking of colson <laughs> the 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 minutemen also do this all the time they they uh disintegrate variants like every day it seems like and just just that parallel of like oh the people you're disintegrating are actually just like you uh, that's probably what broke C20. Yeah. it's. It, I mean, it is confusing at the moment. Like, who gets disintegrated? Who gets repurposed? Mm-hmm. Is disintegrating that we, we suggested earlier that, you know, the the pruning is actually just, or resetting is, is recruiting. Just like teleporting to a processing facility to be turned into a Minuteman, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's possible, too. Mm. Those, those and- don't actually disintegrate everything. They just teleport you. Yep. Very slowly. <laughs> Painfully. I, I do f- feel extremely bad for C20. Yeah. Realizing, realizing yeah. how traumatized she must be if she has the cognitive function to realize what's been going on. Right. At this at this point, we don't know how, what, how much she was fucked up. Is there a chance that when we get back to the TV, everything is in shambles because Mobius has led a revolution? <laughs> I would, would suspect have... that he wouldn't lead that revolution before he has the impending, extremely interesting conversation with Loki. Yeah. He's going to have an identity crisis is what he's going to have. Yeah. I would think that we see that before we see any revolutions, yes. I also feel like this slightly supports the idea that the that the time war hasn't happened yet, because like, uh, Sylvie says that, that C20's memories were hundreds of years old and like obviously they seem fairly contemporary and that's because the TVA is not you know time isn't linear and the TVA is not in time but to me it seemed you know the fact that like in in Pompeii Loki was like when are we are we in the future from the future and and Mobius doesn't answer him I feel like there's like they're just sitting at the end of time or something well yeah um uh, I think Jamie had mentioned that Infinity Stones don't work outside a universe, so maybe there's some in some kind of pocket universe or something. Yeah, it's its own reality. Mm-hmm. That's what they're really doing is just jumping between reality into different points in time. <laughs> it would make it easier if you weren't on that timeline to jump into it at any point. This is true. This is true. Depending on what rules you're going by. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Loki is quite surprised to learn this, uh, and... You can just tell his mind goes immediately to Mobius, and he's just like, "Oh, <laughs> you know," and, and like shocked and offended. Yeah, because well, he's 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 actually he's he's probably annoyed he didn't figure that out. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so they they go and rush into the city, and they hear a, a final boarding in ten minutes. Um, this is a terribly organized planet, but honestly, as I say those words, I'm remembering the past 18 months, and never mind. Uh. <laughs> um, Sylvie and Loki, uh, I guess, confirm that they trust each other, as far as we can believe that. And um, Sylvie says, good, because this is going to suck. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, then we start a long one-shot sequence. It's probably not a real one-shot sequence, but uh, that's okay. Uh, there's, there, are play, there are multiple cuts, cuts but like, it, it's it's filmed like yeah, one. it's very well hidden. Like it's it, if you know, like because like when they started moving, I was like, it's gonna be a long cut, and, <laughs> and then I was like ready to be like, all right, where is it gonna be? Where are the cuts gonna be? Oh, there it is. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, here, where is it? Oh, it's a really good one. Oh, that's a good. One. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and there's yeah. definitely multiple cameras involved because there's sometimes when that camera does things that you would think it wouldn't be able to do even with the dolly unless there was another camera picking up a different angle. Right. Yeah. So basically, I mean, we could go into detail, but basically they just run. <laughs> Run. They run. A building almost falls on them at one point. Loki moves it telepathically. He's not rewinding time. He's moving it telepathically. Um, and seems actually kind of impressed with himself. Mm-hmm. That he caught um, they will put it back up. Yeah. Um, they are running out of time. And um, then it's for nothing because the ship takes off without them. Um, which the they should have seen right. coming. Yeah, it's destroyed. It, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> or it's right at that time when the sky explodes. <laughs> it's hard to tell what's going. Like it's it's a very purple sequence. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I think that that you see the moon like break in half in the atmosphere. I think, and yeah. uh, at that point, a lot more meteors start falling, and then basically, right as they come into view of the rocket, it gets hit with a big one and basically falls in half. The the image of like the moon hitting the atmosphere for realsies and then starting to break apart with it right there over the city mm-hmm. is so fucking horrifying and beautiful. Yeah. That was legitimately like, holy shit! <laughs> yeah, there's some amazing visuals. Yeah, because like usually in stuff like that, like the, you get a wide shot of like the planet and whatever's <laughs> hitting it, like going kablooey, but you never see it up close like that. Like what would happen? Like so that was really cool. <laughs> yeah. But- from the ground floor. And uh, yeah, Sylvie, I don't remember if she curses or just stalks off. I think she's no. fairly silent. Yeah, I think she's just like, well, that didn't work. He just like walks off to die. Mm-hmm. You see a lot of other people in the background too be like, well, guess that's it. <laughs> yeah, we really, we really fucked this one up. Didn't plan. <laughs> Could have gotten off this place months ago, but didn't. Mm hmm. So, yeah, that's, uh... Well, golly, they're sure in a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the, the the last cut of him just staring in disbelief. Yeah. He just he just cannot believe what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, despite the fact that his all of his plans recently have gone awry and he's lost, he still can't believe that he's losing again. Well, it, it, all the other ones, like he could see an angle to work or a way to sneak out or uh, something to some new thing to, to, to work to maybe do something else. But this is like, oh, well, that was the last thing. Now what? We're past the last thing. <laughs> yeah, it kind of Loki is weirdly kind of an optimist, if you think oh, about it. For sure. And yeah, this this would definitely be very... um. <laughs> not not along those lines. <laughs> not a lot to be optimistic about right here. Mm-mm. I watched. I, know, I thought it was a, a really good episode, guys. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. Oh, I was to say, I I watched the episodes all the way through. There was nothing. It there was no end credit scene. Yeah, they haven't started doing that yet. It seems like uh, it's probably gonna start if they do it like Falcon Winter Soldier and WandaVision. Probably start in episode five. Yeah, four or five, I think for sure. Seems to be their their general mo. They start they start littering them in at the end. Two thirds or three quarters of the way through. Yeah, this one did make me think of Wandavision in that you know it shows people the during the credit sequence it shows people typing and like taking notes and it reminded me of in Wandavision when we see someone taking notes mm-hmm. uh, at the during yeah. the broadcast and it made me wonder if Loki was going to do the same thing and that it turns out someone is watching what's going on. At the TVA. <laughs> Ooh, that's an interesting idea. I think it's for sure meant to imply that like, oh, the, the TVA are, are going through the, this timeline of events and seeing what the hell happened. And also, uh, Mobius is probably able, if he knows that they have a t- temp pad and that uh, the variant was hiding out in apocalypses, I'm pretty sure that means he should be able to figure out where they are. <laughs> It, it may be that Mobius figures out which apocalypse they're hiding out in. Uh, there, there's a couple other angles they could still pursue, I think. Because, um, uh, uh, again, like the, the fact that they can hide out in apocalypses means that there's no, there's no changes. So if they can do something drastic enough to change the timeline, 
Like maybe somehow send a fragment of that moon spinning off in a direction it's not supposed to, or or like send a puppy up in a in a in a capsule so there's one survivor. It'll be like that episode that uh, the Inner Light from TNG, where they just send up a satellite so it connects to some guy's brain and makes him re- relive in a simulated reality for a few hours. <laughs> Yeah, I'm interested to see how they how they solve this one, whether it's going to be through their own actions or, or intervention from the TVA. Yeah, I'm thinking it probably will be intervention from the TVA just because of, of just how hopeless this is and like how much like they try to think and then it failed and they try to think and then it failed and they try to think and then it failed. Like mm-hmm. is fourth time the charm? Probably not. <laughs> right. Unless by some miracle they've managed to find something that can fix the temp pad. I think and that's the sale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even think they took the scraps with them. Just kind of left them there in the dirt. I think so. And also, whose bright idea was it to make temp pads have to have such be pain, such a pain in the ass to charge? <laughs> they They probably are not meant to be charged outside the TVA. <laughs> It doesn't seem like people spend a long time outside of the TVA. Right. It seems like they just go out for little excursions and then come back almost immediately. Possibly for many reasons. <laughs> it's just like Stargates. It might be hard to uh, keep the control or the brainwashing active if you're outside of the TVA for too long. That would be interesting. That's true, because they, they must get some some mega deja vu sometimes. <laughs> We know there's some kind of kind of pervasive field since everything magic turns off as soon as you go go to the TVA. Maybe it's just stronger magic keeping everyone brainwashed. There's definitely something going on. <laughs> I I feel like we'll probably get some answers next week, but not nearly as many as we're expecting to get. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I do love like what you said, Jamie. Like it's hard to guess what exactly what's going to happen, you know. And that was the same the same case, like you know last week like we don't know where they're going like what they're doing um i actually really liked that sylvie just went right back to the tv <laughs> like it was you know yeah. it was also a good like red herring for the episode the the cutoff with the the teleporter yeah uh, or just i mean like seeing seeing sylvie like go into the tva and it was like oh okay we're having a tva adventure like it's episode three i guess we're gonna learn more about the tva and no we don't at all yeah i think what what is that sequence like a minute and a half? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, they aren't there for long at all. <laughs> There's one hallway, no. and then they tell just, into a bed. They technically spend like three minutes at Rock's car. Mm. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like they could spend the whole next episode on, on Lamentus, or they could be rescued in the, you know, before the opening credits, or, you know. <laughs> There's definitely a bunch of ways they could go uh, with it. They could have them wallow in this state of defeat for a while. That might be interesting for Lokis. Or they could uh, be quote-unquote rescued and have to deal with uh, the ramifications of their knowledge immediately. I don't really want this, but you know what they say about people who are together at the end of the world. Yeah. Well, for Loki, I mean, that's not really out of the question. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you were talking about how you were talking about how it's kind of like a fan fiction. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best reaction. I, yeah. <laughs> you can't argue with fan fiction logic, and this show seems to be functioning on fan fiction logic. So, <laughs> not. I think they're too much like siblings, like the way that they act with each other. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I prefer that, but of course, I preferred that with Fitzsimmons, and we saw where the, where that went. So, mm. <laughs> what I do hope is, like, I hope, like, she doesn't die, and it's like carry on my mission or whatever, you know? Like, yeah, I hope no, I hope she remains a a viable character throughout the rest of the, at least the rest of the season. I think if anything, it's the other way around that our Loki dies and she becomes the main character for season two. <laughs> <laughs> We just keep working through Loki's as as the seasons go on. Hey, I can't, I can't get behind that. I need the Hiddleston. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people do. 
Uh, speaking of Tom Hiddleston, this is completely off track, but I, I want to bring it up just because I think it's awesome. There's a video of uh, Hiddleston um, doing British Sign Language with somebody in London when he's coming out of a theater. That's cool. And I'm like, Where, how would have you learned British Sign Language? But I guess if you wanted to learn, you would have learned. I mean, it just goes to show that he's one of those multi-talented kind of people. Mm-hmm. And, and that he goes out of his way for fans, too, because he, he held a lengthy conversation with her, like, at least three minutes. That's actually really cool. That's a long time for a celebrity. So uh, Jen in the Discord point out that uh, we have a new Vision from WandaVision. We had a new Captain America from, from Falcon Winter Soldier. So it makes sense to get a new Loki. <laughs> Leave me alone. All right, Michal. No, I think Hiddleston is sticking around for at least another season, most likely, because I, I think he is the draw of the show, largely speaking. Yep. Now at least. <laughs> He's like is... one of like the few stars this whole time that's like everyone else has been like, well, my contract's about to be up, so I might be bouncing soon. He, he's like, he he's maintained being like the only one who's been like, where do you want me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Him hey, and... Kevin, just te- text, like, texting Kevin Feige like you up. like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Him and what's his face? Vision. Yeah, I Paul can't... Bettany. Paul Bettany, yeah. I just remembered his name. Him and Paul Bettany just sitting there being like, we're going to keep going. Give us some stuff. We're here. Where? Go? Me? Now? Later. Hey, I mean, pa- Paul Bettany, I think, is now the longest running MCU actor. Ah, that's Clark yeah, Gregg. No, nah, well, I mean, yeah, if you, I mean, Clark Gregg, in terms of like actual episodes of like, you know, film time, that's probably true. But I think uh, Paul Bettany, in terms of like number of years now, is, is the longest running because he was an Iron Man one. Yeah. So mm. it's Clark Gregg. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying <laughs> but the mean, show that ended and one vision kept happening after that. I mean, in terms of like uh, years, mm-hmm. that's true. If we're talking hours of film, yeah, Clark Gregg, I think, is, yeah, definitely hasn't beat. But that's a separate issue, separate metric. Yeah. yeah. Also, Paul Bettany was famous before this, and <laughs> Tom Hiddleston became famous through Loki. So, I mean, not that he wasn't wasn't in anything, but it it definitely was his first major role. Yeah, wasn't I? I think I even heard that maybe like his first American role. Like everything else was just like Britain only. Yeah, it's neat. We get all their actors eventually. <laughs> <laughs> all their good ones. Actually, that's not true. I should not have said that. That is just yeah. uh, just objectively not true. <laughs> Every now and then, our actors go over there. That's. I think that's a lot more rare. The thing is, you have to be a certain level of attractive to even become famous in America. You don't need quite as much in the UK. Benedict Cumberbatch would never have become a superstar if he were American. I'm sorry. He's too weird looking. (laughs) Even Tom Hiddleston, like, I think he's very attractive, but he has, like, us, you know, he's not, he's not your all American boy, you know? Um, And... Yeah, I, I I don't know. This is a personal theory of mine that like, <laughs> I, there's plenty of issues with the UK and film and whatever, but they are slightly more, I think, open to different body type appearances. This has been cultural exchanges with level seven access. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we have anything else we want to talk about this episode? I think we've covered it pretty thoroughly. Nope. Well, I'd say this gets a five out of five, whatever we rate these things from level seven access. Broken ten. So you never <laughs> done, yeah. A plus, do recommend. Would watch again. <laughs> okay, well, I think that'll wrap it, wrap up for us this week then. How about, uh, Devin, since you came in late, how, where can people find you on the internets? Oh, well, you can find me on Twitter at Cree in the Box. And Paige, think about it. I, James, why, why don't why don't you just tell him? James? <laughs> it's going to be quicker. <laughs> you can find Paige on Twitter at Paige underscore Branson and on Instagram at Page underscore Branson. You can find her on Tumblr at Page Branson. You can find her webcomic Legacy's Call at LegacyScall.com. It's coming back soon. Paige promises. She says, we'll I see. I put a date out there on the internet, which means I have to do it. Yeah, Paige, and you know what? I did all that from memory. I didn't even have to look, read the stuff. So. <laughs> well, I have a lot to do with things on my mind. I, 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 I. <laughs> McCall, how about you? 
I'm on Twitter at Ink as Rain. And Michelle? I'm on at Twitter at Michelle H. Writes. I think that is correct. I have it down in our document. It's Michelle Writes. I'm looking writes. at it. Okay, well then you were right that I have it wrong. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I'll fix that immediately. Uh, you can find uh, me on Twitter at Jamie underscore Blumberg or my website jamberg.me. Follow along the podcast on Twitter at Levels of an Access Pod. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash levels of an access. We can email us at levels of an access pod at gmail.com. We'll be back uh, next week with the next episode of Loki. Talk to you all then. Bye. Bye. Loki Doki. <laughs> oh. I, I don't even mind anymore. I'm getting used to it. <laughs>